Awesome. Well, before I get uh, into the real thick of everything, and uh, we've done the sound test, which is awesome, I uh, just want to introduce myself. My name is Richard Anser. Uh, I am a teacher at heart, an educator. Um, I'm behind the Wealth Guardian Education uh, website and um, business. Uh, it's mainly myself who does most of the work, um, and I've been on this journey for about three years now. What I would like to do is just to thank you um, once again for taking the time out to come on this call, um, on this webinar. You know, it's midweek, it's nine o'clock, you could be in bed or doing something else, but you decided to come out and listen to me. Most of you may not know who I am. Um, many of you may have been referred to come on this workshop this evening. Um, to my knowledge, I don't think anything like this has been done before, especially in the UK. Uh, the reason why um, I've wanted to basically teach tonight, um, mainly because it's, it, it's my heart to teach. I, I don't think people really have a full understanding about trusts. Um, I'll be upfront with you that there is a course coming up in the next couple of weeks, um, and this is kind of a precursor for those who was looking or are looking for some form of a, um, a facility to, to get knowledge to utilise, um, particularly with dealing with creditors, um, or people who's trying to harass you for money um, or really just if even if you're not in any debt scenario just to protect your assets moving forward in this life um, because everything uh, every relationship pretty much constitutes a trust relationship and most of us have no clue at all that we've e we're even in a trust relationship so hopefully after these next three days um, and especially after tonight you'll be a lot more aware and privy and vigilant and sober as to what the situation is that you're in, um, in pretty much any situation and circumstance. Obviously, it's a webinar, so I can't be 100% conclusive as I would be in a, a workshop, but um, I'm not here to withhold or restrict any information. That's not my purpose this evening. My purpose is purely to educate um, and to provide valuable content. So no matter what happens after these three days, at least I know that you uh, have a better understanding of, of trust, especially in the UK. There's a lot of uh, educators in the USA who have their system, which is awesome. Um, but we don't tend to have many people over here. So I don't mind um, putting my head above the parapet and saying, uh, here I am, listen to me. Um, because it is our freedom at the end of the day and it's our rights, which we're talking about this evening. Um, also, since we're going to spend a bit of time this evening, um, I do try my, I will try my best to stay within the two hours. I really will try. Um, because this subject is a really exciting one for me, um, and I, but I'll try and contain myself. But since we're going to spend a little time for the next three days, um, is it okay if I can just maybe share a little bit about myself, uh, my background, who I am? Um, just type in a wife, it's okay, I, I really appreciate that. Um, as I said, my name's Richard, I'm uh, uh, 36 now, can't believe that. Married uh, to a wonderful wife, Tracy, um, and two awesome children. Um, and actually, whilst I'm thinking of that, I've just got to give my props to my wife because uh, without her, I wouldn't even be able to do this, um, what I do and spend time researching and studying and fighting and uh, taking on people. Um, and she's been really patient and gracious with me, and I do really appreciate her. Um, and also, whilst I'm on the call, um, my friend and, uh, I guess, a study partner, uh, a key maker, also known as Kevin Griffith, just to say a big thank you for taking the time out to deal with my uh, frustration sometimes and um, putting up with my uh, ups and downs. But um, and I encourage you, whilst you're on this journey, to be to have a business, a business partner, to have a study partner, because it can be a bit of a, a lonely journey at times, and it's nice to just hash out ideas um, or if there's any problems you want to get, um, you know, second second opinions or feedback. But uh, just uh, continuing um, my background. Originally, I was a what you call a perpetual student. Um, I have uh, two degrees um, in me mechanical engineering um, and also a, a master's degree in uh, um, computational fluid dynamics. Anyone know about that? If you don't, it's more about computer modeling. Um, probably the best way to describe it is if you've got uh, a, like a Formula One car uh, and you know the engineers are in the room designing these cars and I'd, I'd be the one um, who'd have a you know a simple 
forgive the, the, the poor drawing, I'm not a very good drawer, but uh, I'll be the one modelling the airflow and uh, testing different designs and working out how uh, dynamic and how efficient um, most engineering uh, facilities are. Um, and my specialty was more in the chemical engineering field. Uh, even spent five years researching the PhD capacity um, when I left university at age 28. I have 15 years experience in the financial services area. Um, I started off working for a company called the Halifax as a debt collector for two years. Um, I then went on to work with uh, um, a company called Evershed Solicitors, um, learning about uh, debt collection and enforcement and how courts work and bailiffs, etc., and, and litigation and harassing business directors to pay up money. Um, I, I then spent some time with uh, Abby, who is now Banco Santander, um, where I got my mortgage qualifications and uh, I really had a propensity for sales. Um, in fact, so I, there's over 100 people on that, the sales floor and I was always within the top 10% of uh, commission earners. And my nickname was actually Commission. I was that hungry. Um, but then I got married really early uh, while studying and I was determined to really look after my family. I then uh, commuted down to London um, and I got a graduate position with Abbey um, as a business development manager dealing with lots of uh, financial advisors and brokers with their mortgages and uh, financial services like life cover, whole of life policies, general insurance, etc. Um, and my goal was to make a million pounds before age 30, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, when I started on a salary of 28,000 and age 28, I'm thinking well, I've got a lot of work to do and I decided to quit my job. Um, and what prompted me to quit my job was uh, whilst my wife was in labor with our first child, um, while she was sleeping, I, I'd be reading this book called Rich Dad Poor Dad. I don't, don't know if anyone's heard of that book before. Um, and I realized that being in the job was probably, for me anyway, a dead end. So I quit my job in October 2005. Bearing in mind, my daughter was born in September 2005. Um, and started two businesses, one in, in their property um, and one as a mortgage broker. I did really well as a mortgage broker. I um, made a lot of money. Uh, I employed staff. I was the top earner in the financial advisory um, company that I was based in the city. And life was awesome. Very, very good. Um, as far as the property is concerned, I accumulated over 28 properties at the time. Um, so I was both advising and buying at the same time. Uh, and then 2008 happened to me. Um, I don't know if anyone can kind of reflect on that story. But effectively, the credit crunch uh, ended my career as a broker um, and I had to liquidate the business and lay off staff and all that mess. Um, I had accumulated quite a lot of uh, interest in um, debts. I kind of studied the you know the rich dad poor dad route and um, lots of uh, good debt and bad debt so to speak. Um, and between myself and my wife we had over a hundred thousand pounds in credit card and loan debts um, and some of the properties that I had purchased at the time uh, were were not positive producing in terms of rent so I realized I was in a pretty sticky position without making good money as a broker. I also made the mistake of only having one source of income, which was a very uh, dangerous thing to do. So effectively, I was between a rock and a hard place. My back was to the wall. Um, I'm also, I might as well let you know now because I've been mentioning it quite a lot throughout this, these next few days. I'm a born again Christian. I'm also a pastor. Um, and so at that time, I, I couldn't, go down the, the big B where the bankruptcy routes um, just because at the time my knowledge was more well I've got to pay what I owe and so it uh, came to me now I didn't know what to do because I, I, all my savings has pretty much been uh, hemorrhaged paying off these debts and these creditors and um, trying to maintain a good credit file you know in, in the control system so to speak and then having realized that uh, when that all dried up um, they still wanted my blood and I had nothing to offer and I got some, some information from a, a colleague and um, pretty much um, I've not never looked back since. Uh, I, I went to a, a one day event. I don't know if anyone's heard of uh, Liberty World Club. That's how I first kind of got started on down this route. Um, and after all the tears and picking myself up off the ground of realizing that I didn't have a clue about money and finance, even though I had over 15 years experience in it, um, I decided, well, I'm going to learn this stuff and apply it to my life and I'm going to teach it as well. And uh, three years later, here I am. So that was my, my basic journey. Um, 
I came across trusts um, exactly a year ago. I was in a situation where um, I was getting a lot of harassment from uh, a, a, my local council um, to the point that uh, I think a bailiff, because I've always uh, given him a, lot, a hard time and he's never been able to win or you know have any kind of a power over me, and he's, he got frustrated. Um, and so it's pretty much it was almost a, an everyday harassment. Um, and it got to the point where uh, I had to do something and do something fast. And I, I didn't know much about trust. I only got a really a little gist about trust. And I, I expressed my very first trust, which I'll teach this evening. Um, it was done all wrong, <laughs> and then looking back now. But it was the very first one. But what I did realize is that pretty much within 24 hours, everything ceased. Um, I had, had no more harassment from the bailiffs because I had made them a trustee. I had no more harassment from the council because I had made them trustees. Um, and in fact, what had happened, the bailiff had served me on behalf of the council, served me with a statutory demand, which is anyone, I, I don't know if anyone understands what that is, but that's pretty much one step before bankruptcy. Um, so the council was trying to make me bankrupt for like two, three grand or something like that at the time. This was about a year ago. So... Um, what happened, the statutory, the statutory demand disappeared. Just, I, I basically wrote to the court, told them that I'm the beneficiary, don't bother me, go and speak to my trustees. The debt's been paid, so if you have any more questions, go and speak to them. And it's something very empowering, um, being able to tell someone to go and speak to the, your trustee, don't bother me, I'm just here to enjoy the goods. I don't bother pay with it, pay for it. Um, and as I said, that disappeared, literally. Um, I had n nothing at all for, for about six to eight months. Um, and then they tried to cajole with some other kind of uh, small claims case, um, which uh, that got struck out by Northampton County Court. So I had won 2 nil again, because of the power of trusts. Um, and then the rest is kind of a long story, but effectively I'm still in that battle, but effectively I'm not bankrupt and, and pretty much I've won the game. So I realized from that very first time of expressing the trust, um, especially with people who, as uh, if anyone's had experience with council tax, they're probably one of the most vicious, probably more so, vi more vicious than your mortgage lender. Um, so don't think about taking on your council too quickly until you've got some full knowledge behind you. But um, one thing I did learn that trust obviously is very powerful and I pretty much spent all of my time and my energy in learning about trust um, and how they operate in the United Kingdom. Um, so who do I who do I uh, learn from? Who's my mentors? Who you know? What do, who do I learn from? Well, what, first of all, um, initially I was uh, well. I say initially I still am. Um, I pretty much purchased all of his uh, videos and DVDs and audios. Um, Winston Strout, um, which is not really a, a strong trust proponent, but uh, without his knowledge, I probably wouldn't be here um, in terms of my level of understanding. Um, number two was um, his name is Brandon Adams I don't know if you've heard of him um, you can google these people um, and uh, I'd probably say they've probably got the cleanest information on if, you, if you're a very internet uh, focused researcher um, and probably the person who I would give most credence to in terms of my learning um, is Christian Walters um, and so and he's really the trust guru um, as far as I'm concerned so but everything's still American everything's still um, you know needs to be translated to UK uh, policy UK law um, and facility and, and, and really I couldn't find anyone out there who could help me so I had to pretty much do the study myself um, between myself and, and my study partner. So tonight is all really just to give you an insight as to how exciting, how powerful trusts are. Um, tonight is, to re is really to empower you to don't give up if you're in a situation where debt seems to be an issue in your life or where someone's trying to harass you, trying to cause you dismay, trying to uh, disarm you or take away your goods. Um, you, you're going to have to be a good chair um, and understand that the, the power and the purpose of this webinar tonight is to draw you closer to getting um i guess the free the free main keys of of uh, any triumph which is wisdom 
knowledge and understanding and without these uh, we're pretty much dead in the water uh, you need to know what to do uh, you need to get knowledge of uh, how, how to go about doing it and you need to have a full in-depth understanding um, so you're not going to be veered or, or distracted or taken down the wrong path of, of your learning there's a lot of people out there talking rubbish if I'll be honest um, and really my my knowledge my wisdom my uh, understandings come from first-hand testing uh, reading their law books reading their policies when I say there I mean the system the government um, which I'm not here to be anti-government at all not at all I'm here to work and operate within the system I operate within it uh, with with knowledge with an understanding um, and being able to operate within it with power and encouraging you all to do the same um, but it doesn't come by uh, a silver bullet mentality it doesn't come by applying a uh, hey presto one two three send out a couple of letters and let's see what happens it does come by having a full understanding of what's going on because trust me uh, there's people out there who do know what's going on and they're doing their best to make your lives a misery um, and if they can bankrupt you they will um, and they don't care and they will sleep very happily at night um, whilst everybody else is worrying but um, I'm coming from a tribe, I'm coming from a stock what tells me uh, do not worry about my life, don't worry about tomorrow it's already taken care of and for someone to tell me that means that uh, I must be missing a nugget or two of information um, for, for life to be working for me so without me waffling on anymore, what you're going to be getting from this this uh, series of, of workshops uh, for today, tomorrow and Friday, um, today we're going to look at um, the trusts and we're going to break it down. Please excuse my handwriting. Um, what I do say to anyone who's seen my, who's been to my courses, if you notice poor spelling, uh, just as my mum says, just smile and nod and, and we'll all be okay, all right? Um, I'm, I'm not going to be trying to do my best to, to be correct in spelling every word I use. Um, but I'll do my best to, for you to read it and to read it with clarity. But we'll be looking at trusts tonight, specifically about private trusts. Um, I'm going to teach you how they work, um, how to apply them, how they operate, and really introduce you into the laws of trust. And then tomorrow, we're going to be looking um, more about enforcing the trust. And what I mean by enforcement is how do you compel the trustees to perform? How do you compel these people who you have uh, um, uh, endorsed or you have give, given permission to operate on your behalf um, and if, if they're failing to perform and failing to, to pay your debts um, for you or, or provide the, the, the things that you, you've given them instruction to or you've declared to, to, to be so, um, how do you compel them to move? And so that's what we're going to look at tomorrow and we're going to be introducing some very powerful and dynamic concepts um, about the law system in which you live in. Most people probably don't realise that there are actually two distinct bodies of law and we get the back end of the, of the worst type of, of law which is uh, what we call um, statutes or, or just the common law. Um, but there is something called equity um, and it exists and it's very powerful and it's there um, to, to, to right wrongs. It's there to turn around scenarios which are um, uh, anti-establishment more, more like. It's, it's, it's there to, to, to aid come to your aid when um, things don't look like it's working it will take precedent and it is it has a full authority in fact without equity nothing would exist at all and what I want to show you this evening is that they're actually performing equity against you but we just don't realize it so everything that they're doing we've given them full permission to go ahead and do but yet still we're so ignorant of the fact where they're complaining and wondering why is it happening to me when really and truly if we just got some knowledge we wouldn't have to allow it to happen to us and we can take the full control and the full authority which we've been given. So I hope that's okay for you and as I say if you have any questions then feel free to type, type it in. Now what I want to do is talk about um, relationships before I go into trust because effectively a trust in its uh, purest form is the definition of three types of relationships. Okay, But we're used to um, very or certain types of relationships um, by the way I might be referring to a few books um, just for your own notes uh, what I tend to use for my teaching um, is Gilbert's uh, law summaries I'm not saying you need to go out and buy anything I'm just saying what books I tend to use in case you're interested as I said I'm not here to withhold <coughs> or withdraw or withhold uh, any information from you from even though these are free courses I'm here to benefit you all um, so it's Gilbert Law Summaries on Trusts, okay, 
and that's by uh, a gentleman called Edward C. Halbach. That's H A L B A C H. Excuse my handwriting. Junior. All right. Um, so it's Gilbert's Law Summaries on Trusts by Edward C. Halbach Junior. So I'm going to read just a few. Um, important bits out here nothing too deep but just so you have an understanding about relationships now uh, there's a relationship um, called bailment anyone heard of that before just uh, type in a Y if you've heard of or if you or if you haven't and to say no but effectively what bailment is is where the owner of tangible property that's physical property gives possession <clears throat> but not title to another I'll read it out again It's where the owner of physical tangible property Okay, like a watch or a car, something that's physical, that's tangible, that's real, that you can touch, feel, um, taste and see. Uh, tangible personal property gives possession. In other words, someone can have it, physically hold it and uh, keep it, but not the title. All right. Does anyone understand when I use the term title? Um, if you don't understand, again, say no, just so it gives me a guide. And if you do, um, just let me know so I, I know who can gauge the, the, the um the group this evening. Right, okay, that's most of you it's probably a fifty fifty split there. Right, so um title. Title we will be talking a lot about title. Title is uh evidence that's probably the simplest way for me to put it right now is evidence of ownership. Um, if I said to you today that there there is no money, would everyone believe me or everyone be in disbelief or would anyone on this call right now think, I don't know what I'm talking about or this guy's absolutely crazy? If I use the words here, there is no money. Right, okay, so everyone's in agreement, good. So um, rather than me going into that into, in any much depth, effectively, if you know that there's no money because they've removed the gold then they've had to replace it with something else. Now, um, not to get in too much of the, the, the old commercial uh, maxims at the moment, but effectively, if there's no physical money, all that can exist today is title to money. Title to things, all right? Because it's impossible today to own anything because there's no money to buy. So all there is is title. Um, how do I know that, Richard? Well, probably the most simplest um, example would be uh, you. Okay, um, we all know that there is um, you, the real man, and then there's you, your or your alter ego or your uh, corporate self. Well, I'll just get my black pen here, which we would address as. The straw man. So this is you, real, and um, on the right of the screen is the straw man. Okay, so this is real. This is dead. Uh, in this world that we live in, um, I'm going to call this world, um, say, statute. Or if I copy um, Brandon Adams, he would say jurisdiction. What would he say, actually? Um, I think it was Jurisdiction X, Jurisdiction Y. I'm, I'm going to call it Jurisdiction X and Jurisdiction Y, just for, just for my own purposes. All right, so we've got Jurisdiction X, which is La La Land, and we've got Jurisdiction Y, which is a private realm. Okay, and then there's another Jurisdiction, which we're going to come to in a second, but ultimately, when I see you, um, I'm seeing you the real person, but when you go out on the streets and you go shopping um, to Tesco's or Sainsbury's and you operate in commerce, obviously they're not seeing you, they're seeing your straw man. Okay? Now, how did we get to this stage? Well, you got to this stage, um, and I apologize if I'm losing anyone at this point. If, if you can't um, understand what I'm saying, um, just let me know and I'll try and backtrack. If, if I'm writing and, and the sound is being lost, I will slow down. Um, I'm just monitoring my processor and it seems to be working all right, but just uh, if it is being recorded as well, so we'll be okay. So, um, 
effectively what happened is uh, there's your parents, there's mummy and daddy, there's you. Once upon a time, how many years ago that was. And when you were entered into this wonderful world, you were born uh, free and clear of all rights. Well, all rights, title and interests were intact. Okay? You had God-given rights. And you were free. And then one day, um, your parents goes to what we call a registry. Now, that's a word that you might want to look in your banking or commercial dictionaries because it's trust language. Uh, so you go to your local registry and so the parents pledge you into a system which incidentally is an act of bankruptcy but that's another story so they've given you away to someone else because obviously the parents had rights over you um, you were not in indebted to anybody um, and your parents let's use the word own for, for now and so uh, unbeknownst to them they're just following the law so to speak a system uh, gave you away pledged you into so into society and so that pledging is where we talk about possession okay but in this instance also a title was given now you're not born with the name uh, mr mrs or miss okay these are titles so this is evidencing a title exists all right if you look at your birth certificate you know you've got a unique number unique to you all right it's got your name it also says in the birth certificate that someone informed the crown or the general registry office with the crown symbol that you existed a registry of an entry and so you were pledged into a system all right so a title was created and so you were given a name master or mistress okay evidence in title and then the the real crux of it is a certificate again you might want to look up in your banking dictionaries and look up the word certificate because it's not english the word certificate here basically is evidence in something exists evidence in the title normally all right it's not the actual um birth certificate sorry the birth certificate is not is evidence in that a title exists but not the title itself all right it's evidencing that something exists so that's the closest evidence to the straw man you're gonna have is your birth certificate all right it's a certificate to say that a birth has been entered into the registry you're never gonna see the original um, uh, which is a, the, the live birth documentation um, and the evidence is that you the straw man exists and you are given the title normally evidenced by all capital letters etc etc so that's a trust effectively a trust was created but you didn't know and your parents obviously didn't know what they were doing they just felt they were obviously going into a system now obviously because there's no money there can only be titles to things no one can own anything any day today because there is no money so when you buy land what do you have you go to the land what registry yeah and you have a title number yep so I hope this is all starting to, to come clear so all the titles have to be registered alright because they're gonna, there's one person who oversees the whole of this and it's normally a trustee of some form alright so the land registry is going to be that person for today and they oversee the land registry and every title in the land um, every every land that has title is, is registered everyone understand that alright um, another evidence um, you've got the when you're driving okay uh, you, you, you've got the logbook you sign the V5 um, and the V5 is registering registration document isn't it of the vehicle to who to DVLA alright so hence you do not own your car you are a legal owner that's a trustee you are not the full owner you do not have beneficial rights to your car only legal ones hence if you park in the wrong spot or 
they want to um, clamp you to compel you to pay for parking fines, they can because you're the legal owner. You're the one responsible for paying. Okay, the legal owner is a trustee. You see how they've done that? You bought the car, then you register it to the DVLA. The DVLA have the benefits. They get paid the money for the MOT. Uh, um, they get might pay money for the to road tax. They get paid money for any time you have a you contravene a fine uh, or you contravene the laws of the land. You, as a legal owner, the trustee must pay. They just enjoy the benefits. All right. So you can understand now that the relationships are starting to be apparent. Perhaps we were never taught this in the past. We've never seen this in the past. But trust me, the rich have a very good handle on what's going on here. So I'm just trying to show you. In, in, in very small um, baby steps of, as to what's going on, trying to paint the picture. So, coming back now to the term bailment as a relationship, someone has possession of the thing, all right? So, someone has possession of the thing, but not the title, all right? So, normally, if you go to, um, I always hate using this term, but uh, hopefully, you'll understand what I'm saying here. When you go to the shop to pawn goods, yeah, so you, you give your watch, you go to the, the, the pawn shop. Or the pawnbroker, sorry, let's get that correct. And then you, you give him your watch, all right, and he gives you a ticket. The ticket represents title to the watch, he has physical possession of the watch. Yep, and normally there's terms attached, so if you don't come back for the watch in a certain period of time, title will probably go to him and he can sell the watch to get his money back. But that's effectively what um, uh, 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 bailment is all about. The next type of relationship you might want to look at. Um, or think about here is agency. Anyone heard the term agency? So you're someone's your agent, all right? So your agency. Typically, um, when someone has a power of attorney, yeah, it's an agency relationship. Your solicitor can be seen as your agent, and they act on your behalf. Okay, so the definition of an agency, an agency often appears very similar to a trust, but it is not a trust. And the duties and the obligations of an agent holding property for a principal are similar to those of the trustee, but it's not the same as, okay? So the, the trustee has title to trust property, but an agent may not necessarily hold title on behalf of the principal, but the holding of the title is not an element of agency. So as far as an agent's concerned, he's not bothered about any titles either. All he's bothered about or possession of anything. He's just acting on your behalf. But the buck stops with you, always. The agent is not you. The agent's only acting on your behalf, but he's not you. The power of a trust is that the trustee is acting as you in a capacity. A limited one, but still in a capacity. That's the difference in the trust. But in agency, the buck stops with you, um, unlike a, a trust relationship. The next form of um, relationship I wanted just to highlight is what we call a debtor-creditor relationship, which every, pretty much all of us on this call are in a debtor-creditor relationship. Everyone heard of that? So, because tonight I might use the term DC, and now you're going to understand what that means. It means debtor-creditor. So when people talk about promissory notes and A for V, you know, if you understand that, that's fine. If you don't, don't worry about it. But effectively... The relationship that we're in right now with our, our creditors or with the courts or pretty much anyone you're going to do business with is typically on the debtor-creditor side. And so how this system works is they layer relationships and only show you what you need to know rather than what you should know. All right. So the trust is on the absolute foundation of it all, the bedrock of it all, but they hide it with various types of relationships and most commonly... Uh, the most common relationship is the debtor-creditor one. So the definition of a debtor-creditor relationship, I'll just read it out, it says, a, a debt differs from a trust in that although the creditor may have a claim against the debtor personally, the creditor has no interest in any specific property of the debtor, all right, at least if not until you go to court or something like that. So um, for distinguishing, I'll just read this part out, it says, notwithstanding some obvious distinctions, it is obvious it is sometimes difficult to tell whether a debt or trust relationship was intended in a given situation, and the crucial distinction is usually whether the party is intended to create a relationship with, res a relationship with, res with respect to specific property. So this is how, uh, let me explain that for you in better terms. You go to your bank, and you deposit some money, all right? cash 
Everyone still with me? Okay, everyone's still okay in this call? I've not lost anyone, have I? Just type in the why, but it's still okay for you. I'm just building the picture, building the foundation, building the layer for you. It will all come apparent very soon. Um, you go to your bank, you deposit some money. If you go to, um, if you have um, five lots of £10 notes, okay, and you deposit, and to depose means obviously to, to, to alleviate yourself of, so in other words, you're lending the bank some money when you deposit. So you deposit some cash, all right, the £50. Then you go to the bank the next day to withdraw. All right, now you're going to do a, with, a withdrawal. So what happens, all right, so you do a withdrawal. So you go to the bank and you take out... 50 pounds the question I have to ask you is the 50 pounds that went in is it equal to the 50 pounds that came out just think about the last time you went to a bank to either do a, a deposit online or if you're going to keep it really really simple just deposit a, a, some cash notes in the bank account and then you do withdrawal of the of the cash notes out of the bank account were they the exact same lots five lots of 10 pound notes Typically, no. All right. That's the evidence of a debtor-creditor relationship. Whereas a trust relationship... So the debtor-creditor relationship means that the, the fact that you deposited funds makes you the creditor. You probably didn't realize that. And that the recipient... is the debtor. Also another um, evidence of a debtor credit relationship is that it's what we call a general relationship. Alright? A general relationship and pretty much all of our relationships are general. And that's how the system likes it to be because they can operate in uh, their body of law um, which allows them to get away with pretty much anything they want because everyone is ignorant to what's actually going on because of this wonderful and very dangerous term called general, all right? Um, and so the general relationship as far as the cash is concerned is if you have five lots of £10 notes with serial number 1000, 1001, 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004, and then you... Uh, make a deposit and then you make the withdrawal the next day and then you're going to get um, one two five seven or one two five six seven one three six nine four etc are they the exact same notes no they are not so the bank have now assumed something okay whereas they're not bothered about whether you got the exact notes back out as long as you got five lots of ten pound notes okay so question to clarify when I deposit fifty pounds in the bank um, in creditor as they are the recipient they are the debtor that's correct they have your money now uh, line dropped out of that point okay yes yeah. so basically when you depose to a bank they have your money they owe you that's why you have the right to, to withdraw all right so that that's the, that's what's going on now, when you signed your, just whilst I'm on the point about banks, just in case I forget later on, when you opened your bank account, when you opened the bank account, you signed the paperwork, all right? And you signed in a general capacity. Now, those who've been on, on the, um, you know, not trust route, but say... Uh, what I call the debtor creditor route, so you know, um, promissory notes and proof of claims and all this stuff, you know, that, 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 that kind of journey. We would normally use a term like authorised representative because if I go back to the straw man argument, obviously that's not you, isn't it? They can't see you in the real world. I should have just redrawn it. Apologies. I'm just going back to the straw man. Right. So there we are. Gone too far.
All right, so it's the straw man who's doing business in this fiction. You're the physical life force energy going, doing all the work, walking up and down. But anything that's being signed, anything that's been, uh, any transaction taking place, it has to be the straw man because he's your corporation in the public world, okay? And the public world is a fiction. And when I say a fiction, it's just man-made. It's a story and you're just playing the game, all right? Um, but the private man is the one who's actually going there do, doing the work. Now, I've actually got to be more correct now um, in saying that. And let, let me uh, get to a clean slide so I can demonstrate this for you before I move on and break down what is a trust in uh, further detail. I'm hoping this is, is, a, is a good introduction for you. I'm just trying to break down and make, lay the point about relationships. But here we go. Now we have, in reality, um, the real man is up here. The real physical flesh and blood man, all right? And then, and he's outside of all of this, this mess, really and truly. And then you have what we call operating in, in the private. I don't want to just confuse anyone too much, but what we used to, what we used to call the real man is not actually real he's still a straw man but he exists in a different jurisdiction all right and then we have what we call the straw man in the public world and then we have the real physical flesh and blood man in a completely different jurisdiction which i will call x all right completely outside so you've got public private real so you are going about doing all your work they can't see you because you're too powerful but you didn't know how powerful you really are. And I'm, I'm going to prove it to you later on, and don't just take my word for it, but you are extremely powerful. If you, if you didn't have any power, this system wouldn't be working how it is today. But, the, 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 you know, it's, it's the old divide and conquer argument. Keep you ignorant, keep you devoid of your, of your strength, uh, of, your, of your heritage, of your background, of your past, yeah? And then you don't know where you're going. It's as simple as that, so you don't actually realize who you are. Keep you bombarded with, um, with fear, bombarded with problems, with issues, with stress. Then you shut down and you're not able to perform how you're supposed to perform. It's as simple as that. That's how it works. So that's the job of, of the outside world to keep everyone blind of who they really are. But use your powers against you and uh, for their benefit for this system to work. That's effectively how it's operating. So you, the real man, exists. You're very powerful. Unfortunately, when you signed or your parents put you a birth certificate, the private man was created. And then when, um, because they don't think you're even responsible to deal with all this money from the bond out uh, of the birth certificate, then hey presto, you sign in the national insurance system. And so now they give you benefits. <laughs> they give you benefits. And it's a benefit privilege to be called Mr. It's a benefit privilege to go to prison. It's a benefit privilege to to um, receive national insurance, etc. It's all the benefit privilege to be arrested. It's all trusts, okay? You gave them your permission and you didn't even realize it. So unless you correct relationships, then th they're gonna still use the old relationships against you. That's what gives the power for a policeman to arrest you, your straw man, because unfortunately you're in that corporate system. And until you tell them in, in the correct way that you don't belong there and people have tried it with common law and you know with debt to credit and all this stuff but effectively it's that's all contract it's nothing to do with that it's all about um, rescinding the trust relationship and correcting your relationships and making people aware of your full rights that's, just, that's how it all works once you understand that then you're going to start getting into the realm of into the real world where you're supposed to be all right um or getting into the private um, and operating your public corporation how you're supposed to but that's not for today's class. That's just, just giving an idea of what's going on. So um, let me let me get back to, I've just sort of defined different types of relationships, debtor creditor relationship. Effectively, what you just need to understand here is that it's general and it's not specific. Right? It's not specific. Whereas a trust relationship is very specific. A trust relationship is like a private bank. A private bank is also known as a repository. Have anyone heard of that before? To repose rather than to depose.
Okay, so effectively, um, a private bank, if you put in five lots of £10 notes with uh, title numbers 1001, 1002, 1003, etc., when you type uh, withdrawal, you'll get back notes 1001, 1002, 1003. All right? It's specific. And now you're going to get into the realms of a trust. So the key lesson here is define your relationships. This is what we failed to do. And so what I teach um, and what I'm trying to uh, bring to the light for tonight and really to carry through for the rest of these next um, couple of days is to let you know that it's all about the relationships. Once you know who you are, you control the relationships that you're in. I had a very um, interesting situation today. I'm not embarrassed to tell you. I went to get some fuel um, and I had some money on my account, but the type of account that I've got, you've got to transfer it from your bank account onto your card and I forgot to do that so I went and paid, got to, got, uh, got put, put some fuel in my car went to pay and the card declined I thought what do you mean it's declined there's money in there and I realized what happened so they said oh no problem just come and speak to the to the cashier and she basically you know took my name my address my details prints out two kind of mini receipts with my name and address on it saying I promise to pay uh, the sum of whatever the fuel bill was within seven days now, what is that? Is anyone, did anyone understand the question? It's a promissory note. <laughs> so, I was, so I was wondering, why are they so relaxed and you know, they're not even causing me stress? Uh, exactly, it's a contract. It is a trust, but effectively on the surface of it, it's a promissory note. Now, they said sign both copies. So I got one, they got one. So I've got to come back and pay the, the, the outstanding balance. But they've, they've been paid twice now. And so now I realise, now today, I didn't bother to um, endorse my signature or restrict it to limit their ability to monetize my money. I could have put a restricted... Restricted... We're going to use a new word here, a new term endorsement well, similar to a signature but since we're in banking we're going to use endorsement okay if I restrict it or limit it they can't then construe or make up a general relationship one way it's all going to come clear very shortly so I'm just trying to see everything you have to, you have to control your relationships so I think um, there's a quick question here. Let me just let me get me uh, scroll back and just find it. Someone just asked a quick question. Uh, so to clarify, when I deposit, no, I've read that one. Um, so do you need to define what a private bank is? Uh, in what respect? I just effectively, um, a private bank in its truest and, and most basic term, uh, if it's a, a true private bank, i.e. operates in the private, would be a repository. So in other words, you put your gold, if you put a piece of gold in, in a private bank, uh, you should get the exact same piece of gold back out and not an IOU or something similar, but not the same. All right? So Cater and Private Bank, is that the same thing? I'm not too sure. I know they are a private bank, but effectively uh, there's certain things that they can do that your high street bank would not be able to do. All right, but effectively, if you're going to operate in true, uh, in true private banking, then effectively they're going to deal with you as a as a as the real individual, and not as technically as a straw man, depending on certain contracts that you're operating in, and um, you should have a private vault that you can deposit things in and get it straight back out again if you're operating in private banking. So that's that that's my understanding of a private bank. Yeah, so just so you're aware. But you just got to define what privacy is, read their terms and conditions, and make sure you're in, in strict private relationships. Um, well, they say they're a private bank. Uh, Coots, they say they're a private bank. 
Um, but you just got to read the small print and understand if they really are or not. Um, possibly. But let me just get back on track. Um, so let me get back in. Let's get into trusts now. So you all understand. Um, I know it's been uh, or not that brief, but I've, I've basically um, categorized the fact that relationships is something you need to look out for and be very aware of. So let me get into the real crux of it now. What is a trust? Right, we've looked at all the other relationships very briefly. Uh, what is a trust? Question mark. Now I'm going to read. I'm going to read a definition of trust. Another book that you might want to write down, um, which I teach from. Uh, very good book. Very good author. Um, Alastair Hudson. That's a professor, University of London. I think he's got some good material online as well. You can listen to like some podcasts um, you may or may not get it initially but uh, the guy knows his stuff and his books are extremely good um, and this book I'm reading from is called Equity and Trust it's the sixth edition I have um, by Alastair Hudson Alastair Hudson um, and I'm reading uh, from page 47 and he says express trust, which we're going to be talking about. There's many types of trust, but we only deal with one type of it, which is express trust, which I'll go into in a minute. But I like what he just says. says a, a description of a express trust might run as follows. A trust is created when the, when the absolute owner of property passes the legal title in that property to a person, normally a trustee, to hold that property on trust for the benefit of another person, which is typically the beneficiary. All right? in accordance with the terms set out by the set law. So he's been very polite there when he says in accordance to the terms. Um, he says there are three legal capacities to bear in mind in the creation of a trust. You have something called a set law, the trustee, and the beneficiary. And these three capacities form what he calls a magic triangle. So we're going to look into that just very briefly. Um, that's a very basic but very good definition of a trust. So Alistair Huston if you, it's a very thick book, but it is a very good book. I teach from it. There's a lot of gems in that book. Uh, equity and trusts. Okay. Can you all hear me still? I'm just hearing a little bit of uh, feedback in the in my headphones, just making sure you can hear me okay. Just type in a Y if you can still hear me clearly. There's no dialect voices or anything like that. Can everyone hear me still? No sound. Okay, what? Well, no sound because I was quiet. Can you hear me now? Just making sure. All right, good. All right, we're on track. Brilliant. Okay, so thank you for that. Right. Now, triangle trusts. We have the one who creates a trust in English law. They're called the set law. S E T T L O R. The set law. In America, can be used or known as trustor, okay, um, or grantor. All do this, effectively do the same function, effectively. It, but in UK law, uh, we have the set law. All right, we have a beneficiary. We have a trustee. It can be more than one trustee. There can be more than one beneficiary. Uh, there can only be one set law. Okay. Um, and each one of these capacities, as uh, Professor Hudson has mentioned in his book, I would prefer to say each one of these capacities are relationships. Uh, they're three distinct and separate relationships. Everyone has their role to play, and if they play it properly, then life is good. All right, now I'll probably go more into the history of trust tomorrow when I talk about equity, but effectively, what the the textbooks tell you that came back in you know early the early um, English history um, I think there's even uh, traces to North Africa and certain things but um, effectively in English history you know uh, the soldiers would go out to war um, and so uh, they to protect their estates they would put it into trust with um, some somebody uh, at home so in case they died at war that there'd be someone to manage their estates for their family etc and that was the kind of the beginning of trust um, 
personally, I don't believe that. I believe trust stems all the way back uh, to year one, well, year dot. Um, and I can prove that. I'll, I'll read some biblical text to you. And it quite frankly, it proves to me that there's no other book that proves to me um, more than the Bible that tells me who I am and what I, what I own. Um, it says that I was given possession and that I own everything on this earth. And you, not just me, but you and I, we are all the, the, the benefactors of this earth. We are all the owners of this earth. And so therefore we have possession. And if we have possession because we own everything and since we have the power, which makes perfect sense why this money system works the way it does, then we're the one who can grant or put things into trust because it was given to us. So the very first trust was actually in the book of Genesis. But I'll prove, I'll prove that to you probably tomorrow. So um, so the settler owns something. He has full what we call rights, titles and interests in property. Now, property could be anything from... Um, well, property can be tangible, which is physical. Uh, you can touch, taste, smell, well, t touch, taste, and at least uh, see it. So it can be tangible or intangible. It could just be a piece of paper. It could be a certificate of evidence in you own um, air in a bottle <laughs> and no one's claimed it. Yeah, it, it, it could be rights to something. It could be uh, copyright, whatever it may be. Um, if you can prove that you're the full owner to it and you have rights to it, interest in it, and title of it, then you are the set law. All right, very important. It's yours in full, okay? Not partial ownership, but full title. Very important. Full title. So therefore, uh, once you understand that relationship, that's the settler's role. His job is to put or deposit funds. We call it funds. Uh, historically, it's the res, which is the property. All right. He puts that into trust. The trust is like a black box. It's not physical in any way. It's just a relationship and everyone has their part to play. Um, and each person's relationship is predicated on the property that is in trust deposited by the set law so the set law um professor hudson said use the word creates terms i think that's a very loose um and probably not an accurate definition the set law creates law what the set law says goes the set law is the king i don't care in what jurisdiction whether you're in the current admiralty jurisdiction right now, uh, whether you're at law or in equity, it doesn't matter. What the set law says goes. He's the lawmaker. Even statute supports that. Law books supports that. The set law is the one who creates the terms. All right? Now, you have different types of trusts. Just to keep it really simple, you've got um, what we call intervivos, which is a, you know, a, a trust created whilst you're alive. And then you have, um, uh, uh, um, what's it now? It slipped my mind. Basically, uh, with wills and probate, but effectively in death, in test dates, etc. Thank you. Testamentary. All right, so that's created in death. So that's all related to wills etc all right so we're dealing with living trusts all right now effectively the set law he creates the law all right what he says goes but you have to own that right you have to own that that knowledge you have to not accept my word for it you have to know it and this is probably the biggest hurdle when you're learning and studying and uh, implementing trust because the main question asks is can I do that which means you're not fully sure of who you are yet or what you can do if I say you can do anything then there should be nothing limiting you it comes back to the matrix effectively isn't it you know Neo had to learn that nothing could stop him because he was he's been programmed for all his life that he had limitations and then he gets into the out of the matrix and he, he realized that he can uh, you know be suspended in air for how much minutes if you wanted to uh, 
he he can dress how he wants. He 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 can taste what he wants to taste. He, he can live how he wants to live. Um, he can be indiscreet. He can be completely um, oblivious to, to the public. It's up to him. All right. He can dodge budget, bullets once he was ready to do so. He can stop it. He could read the matrix itself, etc. Why? Because he had to realize who he was. And it's the same thing for you. You've got to learn who you are and understand that you are the lawmaker. All right, so question. So ideally, in creating a trust, I want to be both the set law and the beneficiary in the ideal world. Now, it may be ideal for you to be the, 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 the trustee. It depends on each individual specific relationship that you're trying to establish. But ideally, you want to be the beneficiary, yeah, nine times out of ten. So, effectively, the set law is the lawmaker. What he says goes as far as his trust is concerned. Now, once the set law... So when the settler creates the law, this is what we now call uh, the decree or effectively a declaration. Right now in America, they say, um, I've even forgot what I use now, the, um, oh, forgive me, indenture, which is a very old English word, which is no longer used in law in this country. It's archaic. All right. Um, and I know that because I had a, a, a high court justice tell me that <laughs> when we were talking about trust in the courtroom. So I realized that I can't be using these American terms anymore. If we're going to do anything in this country, we're going to have to uh, make it completely UK specific. So um, we don't use the term indenture. If you've heard that before, it's better to use declaration. And the set law declares what he wants. He makes a declaration. He is the king. It's kings that makes decrees. It's the kings, and it's a generic term, ladies, by the way. It's not just male-specific. It's generic, all right? We're all kings, all right? So, therefore, we make declarations. We state what we want, all right? So, therefore, you're the lawmaker. And you must understand that, and you must have that knowledge, and you must own that knowledge. It's, it's, no, it's not good enough for me just to say, Richard, uh, or, you know, whoever's on the call, you know, Gary, whatever it is, Paul, uh, by the way, you're the lawmaker, just accept it. No, you have to own that knowledge. You have to know in the in the fiber of your being that what you say goes and you stand on it. So you're the set law, you declare. When you declare, that's the law. It's as simple as that. And only kings make declarations. Simple. So that's the set law's role. Once he puts his declaration in and he de deposits what he wants to go into the trust, all right, so he puts it on his res into trust, the set law comes out of the relationship because the, the relationship now turns into a different scenario. All right, so he steps out of the picture. So let's go back to our triangle. So what you're going to have to look at is you have the set law. He declares and he has ownership. We're going to use that term because we're talking about the real man now. Okay, The ownership is evidenced by title. Don't get me wrong. But he has ownership, okay? Um, he has full title, all right? Absolute title. A loyal title. Right? Full control, full rights, full everything, okay? Full title. That's the settler's role. So, therefore, now, when he puts that into whatever he owns into trust, the title splits into beneficial and trustee, which would be what we call legal title, or we could say possessory title. The, type, the trustee holds on to the physical property, but he knows his relationship is only to look after it on behalf of or for the benefit of the beneficiary. Does everyone understand what I just said? I repeat it. The set law creates a trust. He puts his declaration, his laws, his terms of what he wants the trust to do. The one who administrates a trust is called a trustee. The administrator of the trust normally has possession of the thing. Whether that's physical, tangible or intangible, the trustee has possession of it in one way, shape or form. 
we will discuss that shortly um, on behalf to benefit the beneficiary so let's let's give an example here uh, we have a car I'm going to call the car a uh, Phantom Rolls Royce okay right so that's the thing that's in the possession of the set law he says right I want my son at the age of 21 to drive this Phantom however he's not going to be responsible for any bills any fines you know fuel cost insurance the whole work no he, that's not his responsibility at all I don't want him to, to pay any of that stuff that's not his job I'll give that to to Jeeves right my son just needs to enjoy the use of the Phantom but as far as uh, the administrative parts of owning this car is concerned no Jeeves will look after that so Jeeves my friend here the, here's the keys hold these keys in trust for my son whenever he needs the car allow him to use the car however if it's damaged if it needs free fueling insurance is due etc 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 Jeeves you are responsible here's some money to sort it out a trust has now been established the father goes on holiday does goes on business he has to he forgets about it now the trust is in place Jeeves is what we call the legal owner he has possessory title to the car the V5 document will be in the name of Jeeves uh, but the son just drives it if the son gets a parking ticket who gets to pay it Jeeves how do I know the father the set law made law told in the law in his declaration Jeeves pay up any bills here's some money here's some assets to sort that out is everyone still with me have I lost you because you gotta get this part else when I go to the next stage I, I may lose you so please tell me if there's any uh, discrepancy here or if, if you're confused this is not school I'm here to teach so if anyone is is lost in any way please feel free to ask the question um, and I will do my best to to explain right so um, the person that said they're slightly lost just ask away all right so I can at least try and um, go over it again do you want me to go over it again I can do that it's not a problem so the question so is the title um, so the title is passed to Jeeves the legal title all right so we have imagine this 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 rectangle it represents full title all right and when the set law gets involved and he assigns a beneficiary and he assigns a trustee that title is now split all right into what we call legal title all right that goes to trustee and then we have what we call uh, beneficial title right the use of the thing right it normally represents the beneficiary so beneficial title goes to the beneficiary legal title or sometimes known as possessory title goes to the trustee alright so in other words the set law has full title once the trust is established the full title is split into two separate titles legal or possessory and beneficial or equitable title all right so analogies to making things clearer um, yeah please expand on that uh, can you just run through the example again okay so um, does Jeeve have any choice in the agreement good question very good question I like I like your thinking uh, Jeeves um, if he knew what was going on 
can have a choice. Jeeves can clearly state, I don't want any part of this, but if Jeeves is under an employment contract with, with the boss, I'm sure his contract would state that he should be taking any responsibility uh, that the set law so wishes him to, to take on board, within reason. Um, as far as uh, the practical elements is concerned, if you were to express a trust today, um, you would make someone aware that they have rights, but since we're in a wonderful world where ignorance of the law is no excuse, it's not your job to make them aware of their rights. And that's the bit, that's the doctrine of notice, okay? That's not your job, because they've never done that to you. And obviously you're going to be choosing or assigning competent, uh, highly professional uh, members of society who would be deemed to understand their responsibility and the office of trustee. So it's not for you to inform them of whether a trustee can uh, say yes or no, or what we would say disclaim. That's not our job. Uh, in the law of trust, which I will be going through slightly, you don't even need to know that you've entered into a trust relationship to be in a trust anyway. All right? Uh, so that's what I'm saying, that we are all in trust relationships, we just don't know. And on the law of trust, you don't need to know. Which is a very powerful concept, and we're going to use it for our own benefit. So another question here. So is this absolute an absolute trust? Uh, I don't go into that's all public stuff, right? Absolute trust, family trust, um, constructive all that business. No, we just do it private trust. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, that's all we're dealing with. So an absolute trust, which I think would be what you're trying to get at, is effectively what we're talking about. But we don't. I'm not dealing with the public. So it doesn't have a, a name beyond the fact that it's private and it's privately expressed by the set law. As simple as that. That's all we're dealing with. Nice and simple. Don't need to get bogged down in titles. I don't, I don't need a financial advisor to tell me what to do. Um, I can create my own trust and I can administrate my own trust once I know how to do it. Uh, will this recording include your notes on the whiteboard? Yes, it will. Um... Understanding of absolute trust is where the beneficiary cannot be changed. Uh, well, if that's the case, then yeah, it's a private trust is, is an absolute trust. But as I said before, what you got to get it, get your mind around is you create a law of what you want to see. So if you create a trust where you don't want a beneficiary to be changed, then so be it. If you create a trust where the beneficiary have has the rights to assign his title to somebody else if he so wishes to do so, that's in your law. That's my point that I was making earlier. That once you understand who you really are. You don't need to get into the rigmaroles of an absolute trust and uh, all these different names. It's just what you say goes. It's as simple as that. And what you need to understand is you don't want the government to have discretion over your private trust because then it's no longer private. So we don't give it titles in the public because then it's governed by the laws of the land, which is nothing to do with you. You operate and exist in the private realm as a real man so you express private trusts, and so it's only t no one else can get involved with it besides you as a set law. It's completely irrevocable, unless you say otherwise. It's your law, and this is what I've got to really highlight: the fact now we don't deal with public or statutory instruments in whatsoever shape or form, because then it we uh, discerned, which we don't want anyone discerning our our documents. We don't want anyone having. Uh, opinions about what we're trying to say it's very much black and white and there's no room for, for, for manoeuvre there's no room to construe or make up um, what someone thinks I may have meant, it's in black and white and it's there uh, for no one to to, 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 um, to disagree with or to, 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 to mix up in any way shape or form so it's absolutely imperative to understand who you are, that you are the lawmaker and what you say goes and it's in the private and it's a private trust expressed by you all right, so I hope I've made that very, very clear. So um, to go back over the example one more time, um, we have, uh, you know, King, oh, so let's just say Queen, Queen Michelle, okay? And Queen Michelle owns a Phantom Rolls Royce. 
All right. Uh, her son, um, her son, has reached age twenty-one, and Michelle, uh, Queen Michelle, has basically expressed a trust and says, "Right, Jeeves, this is her butler." Notice she may not use the word trustee. She'll say, "Jeeves, I want my son to uh, inherit inherit this uh, this phantom roller. He's now twenty-one." Um, here are the keys. Here's the V5. It's registered under your name. However, you are there only to pay bills. Okay, um, such as insurance, fuel. If he gets into trouble, I know he's a young boy, so he may get some speaking, speeding tickets or some fines. Just deal with it. Um, I don't want anything else to do with it. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah, okay, good. So, uh, Jeeves, you're fully responsible. Um, here's my... Uh, uh, I've, I've written it all down and I've signed it, so um, uh, it's in your hands now, my declaration. And here's your responsibility. So the declaration tells you exactly what I want to see happening. I want you to... Um, you, obviously, you hold the keys. Uh, you, you allow only my son to drive this car, okay? Um, or if, you, if he asks you to drive it, then that's fine. Um, we're not going to get involved with that. And then with regards to uh, paying the bills or the fines, uh, that's solely your, your responsibility. And you know what, Jeeves? Here's some money. Um, I'll give you both pounds and dollars. So if anything goes wrong, any problems in the future, then you're the one to sort it out. All right? And I've given uh, my son full authority to speak with you at any time. So um, he knows exactly that he should come to you if there's a, any, ever a problem, um, he knows who to go to. I've just created a trust. Right, so everyone's saying the sound's gone. Um, I'm not sure what's happening here. I'm just going to... Can anyone hear me now, or is it still... Just type in why if you can hear me. Right, okay. Right, we seem to be back on. I'm not going to write too much now. So effectively, as I said, got Queen Michelle. Uh, Queen Michelle uh, own, owns, has full rights, interest, and title to a Phantom Roller. The Phantom Roller, she says, well, I want my son to to to, to utilize it. And then um, because of this, um, because of my son utilizing the Phantom Roller, then effectively, uh, um, I'm going to allow Jeeves to 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 have legal title over the Phantom Roller. He pays all the bills, he sorts out all the insurance, he's the one that pays any fines. But uh, my son, he's a beneficiary owner, he's going to have full use of the car, uh, he'll drive it, um, and that's it, that's fine. Okay, so what I'm going to do, if we just take, uh, take two, three minutes, just have a comfort break and come back. Um, I think everyone's complaining about the sound. I'm just making sure everyone's going okay. Cause I've still got a little bit to go through. A quick question though before I go on. So I could own a car, give beneficiary to the use, the use of the car, but make the local police the trustees. Uh, in theory, yes. In theory, yes. The question is, would you want the, tr the police to be trustees? So it's all about justification. But um, yeah, in theory, you can assign whoever you want to be, as long as they're competent to do the job, um, then yes, uh, they, they can be trustees, no problem at all, um, or use DVLA, as one, someone has suggested, um, but yeah, if it, once you understand the theory, you can do pretty much what you want, as long as you can justify why, so we, what we're going to do is take a, a, at least just come back here, um, it's, say, say 25 past, just come back at half past, to take a comfort break, whatever you need to do, come back I'm going to finish off about trust is that going to be okay for everybody um because it's, it's, it's about two hours or whatever so um come back for 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 10 30 please and then we'll continue thank you very much Okay. 
Right, so uh, what I was um, just saying is a couple of questions come up, but um, just a quick recap because I think people had problems with the sound, I'm not sure. Um, just a last recap, effectively, so Queen Michelle um, owns, has full rights and titles to a Phantom Roller, and uh, she decides and in, in her wisdom that she wants her son, age 21, to benefit and use the car, all right? Just, so when we benefit from something, it means we're enjoying it, enjoying its use. Everyone understand that, all right? So all she wants her son to do is drive the car, look good, dress good, you know, do what it needs to do with a roller, all right? But in terms of the fuel cost, insurance, maintenance, everything else associated with um, owning the car, that's Jeeves' job. Everyone, just type in a wife, you understand that part. And if you don't, just type in a no, then I can at least... Great, right, so we're all on the same page. So Jeeves is the legal owner, a.k.a. trustee. And so he has the administrative, administrative role of maintaining the car, paying the bills, any fines, etc. All right? Obviously, Queen Michelle has to put some money in trust also for Jeeves to work with. So she's put an asset that he can monetize or utilize to pay the bills with, because it's not his job to provide the money, it's just his job to administrate the money. Okay? So that's it. That's the trust. That's as simple as that. Now we've got some questions, and then I'm just going to quickly find them. Um, the first one So if I made you trustee of my household bills, would there be no recourse for you? Uh, there wouldn't be no, the only recourse, if I accepted the role of being your trustee, um, the recourse would be, um, you'd have recourse, full recourse against me if I failed to do the job. But you'd have to prove a trust existed in the first place. All right? I think the trust, that was uh, the question that was asked earlier was, so, so as King, so Queen, why would I need to justify who I may trustee? Now, you don't need to justify who you may trustee in every single instance. Um, but there will come a time when you're going to have to tr uh, prove a trust. So the way we teach trusts, um, even though the law of trusts say that you don't have to necessarily write the declaration down, it can be uh, via parole, i.e. you can give verbal decree, all right, and you've entered into that relationship, and as you know the law of trust, the parties don't actually have to be aware that they're in, in the trust relationship in the first place, so you don't have to necessarily justify a trust, but one the set law must know, um, or one of the parties must be must be aware that a trust is is a trust relationship is being um, created. Now let me give you an example just to make it a bit more uh, clear to you. You've gone to um, the bank, okay? You've gone to the bank and. The set law, by the way, is the one normally who signs. Okay, it's normally the evidence of, of a uh, a written decree. The one who signs is the set law. Okay, um, and he signs an agreement, by the way, not not contracts. Agreements are more powerful than contracts. So uh, you've got the beneficiary here, and you have the trustee. Now, let's say the trustee is actually the bank. In this instance, in other words. You deposit money with them. Their job is to create interest for you, um, and you and be available for you to withdraw funds back from them. Okay, so let's say that they're the trustee in this instance. However, they provide you didn't you just walking you're just living your normal life. You don't know about the relationships of in a trust, but the banks do. The banks know they have no money. The banks know they're bankrupt. The banks know they can't uh, generate any kind of uh, wealth, so to speak, or print money without a real flesh and blood human being um, who's going to uh, be the surety, the, the substance uh, for their system. So you go in and say, hey, I want a loan. Okay, no problem, we'll, we'll give you a loan. And so therefore, uh, what do you do? You sign a piece of paper. All right, so here's your nice, wonderful loan agreement. And uh, it's called an agreement. And, you know, you, you sign it. You're happy with the terms on there.
but notice who wrote the terms on this agreement because it wasn't you was it did you write the terms just type but yes or no did you write the terms exactly so here are the terms and notice that you didn't write it but however you did sign okay now uh, it's the agreement it would have the banks company name on there but notice the main thing is it's got instructions or some form of declaration and the lawmaker signs you sign not knowing what relationship you thought you were going into what we call now a debtor creditor relationship but the bank who understands trust implicitly understands on, on the surface level it's actually a trust but they've just called it a loan agreement and you think you're going into a loan agreement all right so you are going in uh, on the one relationship which is a debtor creditor, debtor -creditor one but the bank and the people who devise this system understand well really it's a trust but I can't afford for you the true owner to know who you are I can't afford for you to establish who you are I just want to see a signature on there and be happy with our terms and conditions even though it's not conducive to you so in other words let's put it this way you provide me with an equitable asset or some uh, 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 your signature which represents your value I put the terms conditions so you think it's a loan and therefore even though I've not even lent you any money at all, at all whatsoever you're going to pay me back money every single month for the next 25 years sounds like a good deal to me um, you believe it's a loan so you think it's a debtor creditor relationship I as a banker know it's a trust and you signed and also because you don't know you're in a trust relationship I'm going to mess things around a little bit for you as well I'm going to now operate in a general way and I'm going to construe some relationships here and the verb con the, the word construe comes from the verb to construct by the way okay so I'm going to make up some things because the law allows me to called a constructive trust so they're operating there's different types of trust by the way so you've got um, your private trust and you've got your general trusts, yeah? You've got public trusts. So that's why I'm saying you don't want to get in the public realm, but at the moment they're using public trusts against you, and con a constructive trust is a type of public trust. It's not actually a real trust at all, it just allows law to um, progress, like the straw man. It's not real, but it, it just allows the system, this fiction, to, to move forward. So that's what a constructive trust does. So you get into the bank, that, and the banker, who actually is a trustee, has construed himself to be the beneficiary because you've put your wonderful signature in there which they can monetize yeah and because you didn't make it a gen uh, make a specific uh, uh, situation they can do what they want because you've not um, endorsed yourself as your who you are in this relationship you've not said that you're the set law you've not said that you're trustee or beneficiary you've just signed it and so the bank said fine all right I know who I am, but you don't know who I am. And the law says that you don't need to know that you're in a trust relationship. So since you signed, thank you very much, I'm going to take the role of the beneficiary and I'm going to make you think that you're actually the trustee. So you're the one who's going to pay me every single month, every month without fail. If not, I'm going to make your life a living misery. And you've signed to that effect. Now, can you start to see how trusts are very powerful but can also be very dangerous in the wrong hands you can tap a wife if you wish or no if you don't see it and I'll explain a bit more so that that starts to now see why you need to establish your relationships okay so can the trustee and the set law be the same person yes the trustee and the set law can be the same person so let me just go over that one more time the set law defines creates establish a trust and then the set law is out of the picture all right there must be a beneficiary there must be a trustee all right the trustee cannot be the beneficiary the beneficiary cannot be the trustee because they have separate roles they have separate relationships and they have separate titles the trustee has legal title 
and the beneficiary has beneficial or equitable title. Um, all right, he has beneficial title. There are two. There are two separate, distinct titles, and once the trust is established, the set law is out of the picture. It's just two parties. All right, if uh, the beneficiary and the trustee decide to be one person, they have merged titles, and therefore there's the trust collapse. There is no trust. It's just it's gone back to one plus two, in terms of t uh, title one and title two have merged to provide one full title all over again. All right. So the trustee cannot be the same as the beneficiary. They're two separate people, but the set law can be either the trustee or the beneficiary but it cannot be both all right so the set law remember they're three separate distinct relationships so once the set law his role is to create the trust once he's done that he's out of the picture he may decide to be the beneficiary in which case he steps in as beneficiary and he assigns a trustee so there's two separate parties so the set law can be the beneficiary all right. So, what if the settler does not provide enough funds to the trustee? Would this be a breach of trust? No, the trustee would just go back to the settler and say, "Hey, I need some money. I can't perform my duties. I need money. I need more money." That's that's just that the trustee can do that. It depends on what powers the settler would establish in the trust in the first place. And this is why you need to understand that you, you're the lawmaker. You can do what you want and allow. But if you're not specific enough, the trustee, since he is now pretending to be you, really and truly, that's his job, he can actually construe and make up stuff as well. He can say, well, I think that if I were to set law, then I wanted to withdraw another £5,000. And if you haven't put a restriction in your declaration for him to do that, it's not, there's no stopping the trustee. The trustees can be very powerful um, because they, they know their power. All right? But the beneficiary, if they understand who, what their power is, um, in the relationship is the most powerful out of the two. All right. So, uh, any more questions around that? Just feel free to ask. But that's effectively how the basic mechanics of a trust. It's three parties. You can have any number of amounts of beneficiaries depending on the circumstances. You can have any number of of trustees depending on the circumstances. But to keep it really, really simple, you have three separate roles. The set law has full title. The set law wants to put whatever he has full title to so whatever he's in possession of he now deposes it um, or reposes that into trust the trust now has full title of it the trust then separates title into beneficial and legal so it splits full title into legal title and beneficial title that means there's two separate titles that are created with two separate roles two separate relationships and the set law comes out of the picture at that stage. The trust is in place. The property is uh, in place. And the beneficiary enjoys its use. The legal, the trustee administrates its use. All right. So the beneficiary, again, talk about the car. So if you're driving the car and you get a speeding ticket, if you don't know who you are, that's why we have problems. Now, a new concept for you. Substance over form. We live in a world which loves forms, loves the paperwork, loves the administration, and loves to get you to comply with that administrative process. That's the language and the work of a trustee. All right. The substance is the substance is your actions, your intentions. Okay. What were you intending to do? What did your actions actually depict, rather than what you have said? All right. So, the um, reason why I'm saying this now, because if you didn't even write one single declaration, you just instructed X, Y, and Z, and you, your behavior was such that you expected Jeeves to do something, and Jeeves did actually make payments um, in the past to pay for fuel and to pay for the MOT and the car to be serviced, then Jeeves is acting like a trustee. No matter what was said, he is acting like one based on the instructions that he received. And... The 21 year old son, maybe he's a sport, but all he knows is it's not my job to pay the bills, that's Jeeves' job. My job is to enjoy it, drive it, do what I want to do with it, but I don't pay for it. Whenever he needs something he's paying for, 
I call up Jeeves, he sorts it, that's fine. So the substance of a beneficiary is one who acts like one, one who knows who he or she is. So I come back to the point now, when you get presented with bills, and you pay, who are you? What capacity are you acting in? Please answer the question. I haven't gone silent. I'm just waiting for people to act so they can tell, talk to me. Good. People are getting it. I want some more answers. That's it. You're acting as a trustee. Now, do you think you really want to be a trustee in this life right now, in this world, uh, where they're giving you grief? Because if a trustee's done perform, it is jail time. Now, obviously, they got rid of debtor's jail and replaced that with bankruptcy. So they they, they are acting equitably towards you, but he who has... He, he who sleeps on his rights has none. He who waves his rights has no rights. And this is the point. So my job is to make you aware of them. And then now is you, our job is to, you make the decision. Do you want to find out what they are and implement? Or do you just want to continue to be ignorant? That's now up to you. But this is where we're coming to now. We're coming to the place where if presentments are going to keep being made or presented upon, and I say you now, you're a straw man, then this is why you need to understand who you really are. All right, so that's why all the DC stuff, you know, about authorized representative and UCC and um, straw man agreement. This it's all trust. At the end of the day, when you break it down to its bare bones, all you're doing is expressing who you really are. And no one really knew how to do it beforehand. I give God thanks for Christian Waters because, of fact, quite frankly, he's broken it all down. He's broken it all down, and you know, um, and he, what I'm teaching now is his stuff. I'm not taking any credit for it at all. I've just made it more anglicized in that respect but effectively what you're learning now is is besides what i'm teaching about the basics of the law of trust you're going to come to see now what we're what we're seeing and what's happening to us every single day we're not defining our relationships and so we're getting done we're getting damaged we're getting uh, uh beaten up in the public because we're just not defining who we are it's just as simple as that so every relationship that you're going to enter into from this point onwards needs to be clearly defined and so you do that by your endorsement, your signature. You restrict your appearance in the public. So before, we would say, oh, authorised representative of or agent of. Well, we just realised that an agency is not the same as a trust. An authorised representative is not the same as a trust. It's all DC. I would now be limiting my relationships in the form of a trust. So normally, if I sign, it's normally, depending on the situation and the relationship I want to be by, but normally I, if it's like a, a rental agreement, it'd be by set law then signature. So I know if there's any problems later on, the, the lawmaker can change the rules. So if they're telling me I've got to pay £1,500 for the car to be damaged, I'm saying, well, no, you know what, I don't agree with your terms. And since I paid, uh, I signed by set law, I can do what I want. They don't know what you're talking about, but their lawyers will. That's just one example. You know, any relationship you go into, you know, if or by beneficiary, if you know you want to be the beneficiary of... At the beneficial end of that arrangement of that agreement is everyone seeing my point here you restrict and limit your appearance in this public world because it's your straw man that's getting damaged and you've got to protect him or her all right so you restrict your appearances you limit them well your relationships it's all about the relationships so now you can start to define who do you want to be. You're always a set law. Always a set law. You are always a set law. You have been given dominion of this earth. All right? So the best way I can define it, tomorrow we're going to go in more detail, but in, even in the basic courses I teach this because it's, it makes pure sense. You have a creator, okay, you have, and I'm not, this is not a religious lesson, this is, you know, the whole system is predicated on the Bible anyway, I'm just trying to break it down for you so you can see, so you've got here the creator, the creator created man, okay, and he says quite clearly that he's given man dominion, then then man now decides, well, we need to have government, this is from Genesis to the five books of the Torah that talks about all this stuff, all right, so you, the man creates government, for some reason government get greedy and want to have power and now man is at the bottom being told what to do but before he was there second in command what are you talking about how does man get from 
there having dominion to being in involuntary servitude he gave it away voluntarily he gave it all away but once you know who you are you can get back on there now something happened as well that made that even makes you even more uh, dominant and free um, and put you back in this position and he re he rewrote the rules completely completely rewrote the rules again I'll prove this all to you tomorrow that's not a problem here I'm just trying to tell you you've got to understand and just take my word for it for today that you have full dominion if it, if it wasn't the case your signature would have no meaning today they could not monetize anything you wouldn't be the surety to all debt in the system you couldn't claim back any funds it's just as simple as that if you had no power you would you'd be useless to the system if you had no control you'd be used to the system but the reason why others have dominion over what's rightfully yours is because they've given it away and now they use you know tactics like uh, you know just deception and, and, and fear based tactics to keep people ignorant of who they really are and what their rights truly are so therefore you can't operate how you're supposed to because you you don't know who you're supposed to be but you you have full rights of course you have only if you say so though you you have to say so yeah you you have to understand who you are that's right if, if, if so, you're going to come to a point because today I'm just teaching but you're going to come to a point that if you have to ask me then you don't know I'm not, not beating up anyone today but it will come to a point now that this is what I'm saying you must know who you are and stand on it yeah you've spelled it correctly no no that's correct. that's the correct spelling S-E-T-T-L-O-R alright so you, you are the one now let me, I'm going to just show you some nuggets of proof here because this who's got a mortgage just type in the Y if you've ever had a mortgage or you've got a mortgage currently and then I'll see how they're using it against you. Trusts, they're using it against you all the time. All right? Because this is so powerful now. Once you understand it, and I say it's simple, just not easy. But once you understand it, then the whole game is now exposed. So you now go, you say you want to buy a house. Fine, you've seen the house that you like. All right? And then you go to your bank. And you say to the Mr. Banker, hey, I need some money not knowing how the banks normally operate so the banks say fine no problem we'll give you a mortgage how many people believe that the mortgage is actually the money just let me ask the question is, is the mortgage the money right that's right the mortgage is not the money the mortgage is a charge alright secured on the house the bank also give you a loan so to speak which is mortgaged okay and they use the house as the collateral to get their money back so just bear that in mind a mortgage is not the money a mortgage is a legal form of charge on your house all right so so therefore now so you want to buy a house the bank's right there saying right we'll give you the money no problem at all for some reason, and now hopefully you will understand how the money system works, but effectively all it is you sign forms, all right, which obviously we all know hopefully is a promissory note. So you've given the bank money, really, but they've given you the facility to, to buy this house. Now, at some point, you've got to exchange. What is it you're exchanging? Titles. All right. And in that exchange process, you have money uh, and the vendor has a house. All right. And depending on the chain and all that stuff, but effectively an exchange, an exchange is going in place. There's someone in the middle who reckons that they act for both you and the bank called a solicitor. And unfortunately, unbeknown to them, they're the vehicle... Uh, that allows the fraud to take place now a few questions mortgage or anyone knows what a mortgage or is and mortgagee
Has anyone heard the term mortgage or before? So uh, normally you're told when in my broker days the mortgage or is one who pays, yeah? And the mortgagee is the one who provides the mortgage. But if you look up in the, uh, a Black's Law Dictionary or a, a Banking Dictionary, all right, the mortgage or normally when it ends in OI is the one who gives pledges. So you've got a settler, or, grantor, trust or um, exchange or you know transfer or pay or um, they're the ones who are giving they're donating they they they're, they're giving of themselves all right into something and then someone ending in e like the payee mortgagee trustee are the ones who have to do something um, and are responsible for something yeah they're recipients typically all right so the mortgage jaw is not necessarily the one who pays that's a deception it's the one who pledges property which tells me just look it up in your dictionary or go online you'll, you'll find it okay the mortgage pledges property which means you own the house in the first place before the mortgage company could put a charge on it the other question you've got to ask yourself is this normally they tell you in the exchange process to sign here but don't date and that document's called a deed. And the deed is evidence of something actually happen, happening. All right? It's actually a trust. It's a, it's a, it's a, it is a trust document. It's a declaration. If you, read, if you look up and dig up your old uh, mortgage deed, it, it normally it's only got four points that lock you tight. Lock you in tight for life. That's 25 years. All right? And pretty much all it says is that you're bound to the conditions of the mortgage company all right to the mortgage condition so you you read that big thick book it just that's the declaration all right it says um something like uh what's it now oh you pledge the property um documented in in section a above or something like that it says that most of them say you pledge property but we don't bother to read yeah oh, bloody bloody blah and then you sign and you have a witness notice the bank has never signed a deed so the bank has never given anything away. So the bank are not the set law. Understand that. So the house was yours, free and clear, which they used your money because you didn't restrict your endorsement on their application form or their promissory, your promissory note, shall we say. Okay. So they got their solicitors to say, right, well, in the background, we can't let them know what's going on because obviously then the fraud will be exposed. We need you to let them to sign the deed, but don't date it. You got to do that in the background. That's the fraud. And notice you had possession of the house, so that's why when when you talk about completion, you own that house anywhere between five minutes and the whole day, between when money is transferring from one bank account to another. You own that title free and clear of any um, disposition of any charge, until the, the, they can get that deed signed and get the mortgage title to the land registry um, and, and say that a mortgage actually exists and then they've got you so that's all trust in reverse all right so it, they're telling you you're the one who pledges property you gave them property you pledge it to them you're the set law notice it was their rules on the deed that you signed but notice if you read any of the documents and I'm not putting ideas in your head or anything like that, but just read the documents. The, the deed doesn't say that it's irrevocable, and the mortgage term certainly doesn't say that it's irrevocable. So there's nothing to stop you from revoking a deed. You just need to know how to do it. All right, so, I'm, so I'll leave that right there. I won't say anything more, but I'm just trying to tell you that you can correct relationships as well as create relationships because you're the set law. It's you, you can do what you want. This is what I'm trying to get in your mind. And that's why I love the power of trust. Because once you know who you are, there's nothing to stop you. Now, obviously, you're going to be dealing with, uh, you're going to be in a fight. They're not going to just roll over and say, oh, okay, fine, uh, you got me now. They're going to try and test you. Do you really know what you're talking about? Hence, you must know your stuff. And hence, yes, you've got to do a bit of reading. And hence, you've got to do a bit of studying. But then once you understand who you are, they can't stop you because you're using their rules and their laws against them. And they don't like it. And then when you're going to learn how to express trust, which we're going to talk about in one minute um, before we close for this evening, then you're in a whole different 
category. You're in a whole different ball game, operating in your full rights, operating in your full power. And quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, they, they can't stop you. They may try, but they can't. And then this is where equity now comes to the rescue, when the at-law world is trying to use fraud uh, or pecuniary, pecuniary matters and scenarios uh, to, 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 to dispossess you of, of, your, of your wealth. Is there any questions at the stage? Have I lost anyone? Are you still with me? Or is anyone in, in shock at the moment? I'm not quite sure. I might have said too much. I'm not quite sure if uh, if people are still with me at this stage. I'm just trying to break it down step by step because there's a lot to this. Okay, brilliant. So, um, that's just one example of how they're using trust against you. you, you, you everything is a trust. Every relationship is a trust. So it says, lost a little, but just need to do a bit more research. Okay, no problem. But ask away if there's any questions. Um, someone says they're godsmacked. All good. Um, that's, yeah, I mean, it is an aha moment for a lot of people. But the, the great thing is that once you know who you are, here it is again, okay? Once you know who you are, you can reverse and change and fix up, which is the beauty of this all. All right? And uh, um, Gary, just let me know wherever you're lost. I can I can go over it again. I don't mind. Right. So, um, so the the main key for this evening is define your relationships. Know who you are, and know you can do whatever you want to do. Obviously, as long as it's not breaking any laws. So you can't just go and kill someone or do something <laughs> that's contravening the law of the land. But effectively, you're the lawmaker. You, you can do what you want. All right. So which of the books do you recommend would you say was the best to begin with to gain a good basic understanding? That one would be um, the Gilbert's Law series by uh, Edward C. Halbert Jr. Um, or another one who I teach with, um, his name's Gary Watts. Uh, but to, see, the thing is, these books right now, unless you know what you're looking for, it, it may not even make any sense to you. You, you just read it, but it be really dry. It's only once I teach from it and show you what it's saying that the aha moments will come. That's in my experience anyway. But um, but yeah, I still list the books. Gary Watts. These are all textbooks that they, they teach you at university. It says, Gary Watt, there's no S, sorry. Excellent author. Probably one of the best ones I've found. And in, in, in he's a UK-based, I think, University of um, Warwick. And it's just called Trust and Equity. All right, so either that one as a basics, um, or or what's it called, uh, Gilbert's law summaries on trusts, yeah, by Edward uh, C. Halbeck Jr. Okay, um, why didn't you put the settler on your parking templates? Because I think I did actually on some of them. Oh, I've asked the question: Are you trying to tr are you trying to construe construe a trust relationship against me? Um, and those park those templates are much older than than my knowledge of uh, trusts as well, but. Um, Again, I wouldn't put stuff like that in, in templates because it's dangerous. If you don't know what you're saying, uh, you can get yourself in trouble. So this is why it's, it's, a, it's a whole new level. It's not just um, saying, well, I'm, I'm this and I'm that. You can say it, but if you don't know, if you're not acting it, if you're not, if you're not demonstrating it, then this world will look at how you're performing rather than what you're saying. And that's the fight. It's knowing to stand on your rights. It's, and, and that's what they're looking at. Well, do you know who you are or not? Let's test him. That's 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 the crux of it. That's where it comes down to. That's what it comes down to. So, um, the, all I wanted to finish off with for, the, for this evening now is the power of expression. So that will lead quite nicely tomorrow to enforce trust. So, um, how do you express your relationships now? Because effectively, what you're saying is I'm trying to create the, the, the relationships. I want to put the relationships correct correctly. I want to correct them and operate the right way. So when I had the issue with the counter tax and they're harassing me, and then all of a sudden everything just went silent and it stopped and got rid of court cases, and, that, and they, they couldn't disprove what I was saying, and it's quite evident, even though they, they might deny me in, in writing, 
uh, their performance is telling me that they actually understand every word I'm saying, then I understand that, that there is a lot of power in trust. So how, how do I express a trust? So what I said was to express a trust means that you, you're basically given a declaration and that can happen either in writing or by parole, which means verbal, okay? You, you have the choice. You don't have to use the words trusts to create a trust. You don't need to you know, use trust language per se to, to express a trust. It's all in, in what you're saying and how you are saying it, all right? So basically the set law gives a declaration and that is the term where we say express, right? And it's private. In other words, it's not statutory. It's not public. All right, it's a private express trust, which the law of the land recognizes. You have the recognition of trust at 1987. Download it, read it. It tells you, quite frankly, that you, the, the set law can define what law he wants his trust to be recognized in. Whatever, it is, whatever law that is, the set law's Designs. Recognition of Trust Act 1987, I think it is. Very powerful document. All right. The court laws, I mean, I'm not going through too much now, but, you know, the courts, books, rules, case law, I mean, is riddled with beautiful knowledge about trusts and how you can use it for your, your benefit. Yeah, it's all there. It's all there. You know? Uh, we're going to go over tomorrow about the rules of certainty, uh, which is a test for trusts, all right, to prove your trust. Because if you can't prove a trust, you don't have one. Because once you express it, you've got to prove. Just come, you're bringing it out of general relationship into private. Now we're going to use words like uh, private, use words like peculiar. So when you're reading or listening to you know politicians and they're using words like special relationship, you understand that they've got another language going on there that most people just won't understand. All right, special, yeah. They're telling you there's something else going on that we don't want you to know. Um, and then others will crop up as as we go along, but effectively you you, you you're operating in a whole different realm. So if I'm saying I'll, I've got a special relationship with someone. And I don't want anyone to know what I'm talking about. Only me and that someone needs to know. But I'm talking about trust. Yeah? Or I've got a peculiar document that I'm looking for. Yeah? Or specific. All right? These are all... Um, so I'm trying to... Well, these, over the next couple of days, open your equitable eyes. So cause when you start to reread books and reread... Watch movies. <laughs> that's a big giveaway. Um, or just read, um, you know, law, uh, law books or case law or statutes and acts, and they define now what is when they say at law, um, or legal. Yeah, this has no legal basis. They're telling you, well, yeah, everything resides in in law, in equity. When the judge looks, you said you, you know, and specifically says what you're telling me has no legal basis. What you're saying is, I can't hear you in this world. Um, right, well, just to answer your question, OID is an expression of trust. That's effectively the, break, the breakdown of it all, all right? But I'm not going to go into OID on this call. It's a separate issue here. But effectively, when you do your OID paperwork, you are expressing the trust. You're operating in your true form, and you're using the, the middleman as, as the vehicle to do that. Um, right, so, yeah, so using terms like at law, the question, sorry if this was on the call, was so is trust and OID all you need to function? Um, just so that no one's lost when they're listening back to the recording. Um, right, so yeah, so when someone says legal basis compared to lawful basis, two different distinct worlds, two different distinct arguments. Yeah? So um, you need to understand is that there's just so much power to this, there's so much room for the manoeuvre, um, and there's so much strength. So when you express a basic trust for anything, any relationship, they will normally run a mile, um, and plus you're going to be paying, well not you, but the trust will pay all the debt. And once you can stand on that, there's not much they can do about it. Now, so let me just quickly talk about expression, and can you still bear with me for a few more minutes? I know I've gone over the two hour barrier, but I did try my best to stay within two hours. This topic, you can talk, I could talk for a lifetime. You know, I did one course, 
that was a four day course and I'm still teaching it. <laughs> so, um, you know, just it's just one of those things. Um, right, so just quickly about the expression of trust now, and then we'll wrap it up for this evening. Now, as I said before, there's a wonderful uh, pyramid, triangle, whatever it is. So you've got the set law. Um, you've got a trustee. And you have the beneficiary. Now, obviously, um, the straw man is by default construed to be a trustee. And you are seen to be the straw man. Yeah? So you're going to have to correct these relationships. So when you get... A demand made against you now when I say you it's really your straw man so someone's writing into you saying we want you to pay a hundred grand in 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 the week's time you know or we'll pay twenty thousand pounds it's not personal it's just business because that's the reason why that term comes from it's your straw man it's not nothing to do with you but you know who you are and you understand the relationship you have with the straw man let's bring this back here all right so if this is you this way, you know, we talk about security agreements and all that stuff. It's all it's basically expressing here. So if this is you and this is your straw man, if anyone's making a demand on your straw man, effectively they're coming after your personal goods, which you don't want to happen. So there's nothing wrong with making your straw man a beneficiary rather than always being a trustee by default. And this is what we now call um, expression, expressing the trust. Man, this is some good stuff here. I've, you know, I think people have paid a lot of money for what I'm teaching now. So, guarantee you, if you if you come on the course, you're going to learn so much more. But uh, at least it will set you up for something much greater. So, here we are now. So, you can express the trust. You're you're the set law. The set law is the real man. Only the real man can own anything, and only the real man can put something into trust because he has full rights, title, and interest to it. So. Someone's making a demand against you. Just I don't know, gas bill, electric bill. I don't know what it is. Parking ticket. Doesn't matter. The demand has been made against you or your straw man, shall we say? And by default, they couldn't because you're the one who normally pays. You are seen as a trustee. Does everyone understand that point now? Not I've not lost anyone. The one who pays. That's an administrative role, and that's a trustee duty. All right. If you're driving the car, that's fine. But if you get the parking ticket. Don't worry about it. Not, I don't. That's not my job to worry about who pays that. I just, I, I just drive the car. Driving the car and and own the car are two different things. That's why now, if you express a trust on all the property in your home, and a bailiff is trying to um, harass you, saying, "Well, you're the legal owner," I say, "Well, no, I'm not actually. I'm not the legal owner. Here's a document that confirms that I'm just the beneficiary. I just enjoy the use of it, mate. All right. But if you want to know who owns it, go and speak to that guy over there. He'll run a mile." Yeah, I remember a bailiff clamping my car. Yeah, this is the same the same harassment. I remember that, and I had to get the car um, chain the name changed on the V five form, and then go out there at five in the morning because that's the time he came to clamp my car, thinking he got me, and I say, look, mate, I don't own it anymore. And he obviously did a check, and then two two minutes later, I remember I was on the phone to Kev about six in the morning, saying that this this guy's just harassing me. He's clamped my car, um, you know, come out, and he's gone, and the clamps disappeared. Because why? I'm no longer the legal owner. He can't harass me. He can't take the car. It's just as simple as that. Once you understand this relationship scenario of who you are and who else is trying to get in the picture that shouldn't be in the picture and where you want to be, that's it. You rule. I hope this is helping people. Yeah, I, hope, I hope it is helping people. So... That's why you don't want to always be a legal owner because it can be a very expensive, expensive life. You know, when you have a mortgage, you're deemed as a legal owner of the property. Even though you have possession of it, they see you as a legal owner and the mortgage company um, deem themselves as the beneficial owner. But that's not actually the case. That's not the truth. All right, so you, is these correcting these relationships. So does this mean that you don't pay any bills? Well, well this is not about me personally. But what I'm saying is I don't have to pay any bills, No. But I pick my fights because there's a lot, well, the amount of um, 
credit cards and loans and everything else I had and, and fighting, you'd be I wouldn't get any work done if I had to express every single one. You'd be there till the cows come home. You know, so you got everything's all in in there. Uh, with common sense shall we say so the, the battles that I choose to enter into is the ones that I deal with and the others they can just get lost or disappear and, until I need to deal with them that's just how I operate because I ain't got time to be fighting you know 20, 30, 40 different people um, I, I wouldn't know where I'm coming from but you as the set law has to provide the funds for the trustee absolutely and we're going to talk about that in one second alright so it's a very good question that was raised it says here but can everyone hear me? Some of the people saying they can't hear. Um, I'm not writing at the moment, so okay, good. So it says that. Uh, so if you have um, a number of properties in them in my name, should I look to put the titles into trust? Uh, the first thing you would do. Okay, what I'm going to do. Hold that thought, um, Gary. Because and then if I don't answer it, please remind me. I'm going to just finish off about the expression of the trust. Then that I can answer your question a lot better. Cause I think people will have 101 questions once I finish this. Um, uh, right. So if I have a number of properties, yeah. So just hold that question. Um, and another one was, but you have, but user set law has to provide the funds. Just hold that thought. And please, um, if if I don't come back, just remind me. I will definitely answer it tonight. It's imperative I answer it tonight. So let me just finish this part off. So effectively, the set law is the real man. He owns all things. The trustee is the one who's deemed and made to pay. Uh, even when you go to court, you know, the defendant, if you are the defendant, you're the trustee because they, they say, well, why have you not paid or honored this contract? What they're saying is you're the trustee, you're to be delinquent. I don't want to hear anything else except that you're going to pay. If the, if you're not saying that you're going to pay, then that's it. You're, I'm making your life a misery. That's all. It's just trusts. It's just trusts. So when you express a trust and you, and you speak in a language to the judge or how I teach, pay it but use the methods that you've got to your availability to pay, like A for B or promissory notes, until you understand trust, then you are not being a delinquent trustee anymore. You've fulfilled the obligation or the office of trustee, and then you can proceed. Now with trust, you don't even have to be a trustee anymore. All right? You don't have to be a trustee anymore. So that's right. The last word I used was delinquent. So... So when you express the trust, you want to basically or get your straw man out of this relationship of trustee and into the relationship of beneficiary. And also the one who thinks they're the beneficiary who should be the trustee, obviously you've got to change that relationship and make them who they truly are. All right, so let me just redraw the diagram so everyone can understand what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to establish here. So, and I'm you have to bear with me because I'm going to be using different colours now to, to highlight and emphasise the point. So, right, so you have a set law. You The trustee, now I'm going to just use myself here, all caps Richard, okay? That's who they're construing to be a trustee at the moment for this example. And then you've got, let's say, um, you know, banks are us. I won't use any real names on this recording. So, banks are us, company who are construing themselves, right? They've constructed a relationship against you because you didn't define your role when you first opened the account. They are construing to be the beneficiary. So, now you're saying, you know what? Now I see what's going on. I'm going to correct the records. That's all you're saying. Now, at the moment, they've got your promissory note in there the assets all right but it's general when we talk about general relationships it's still debtor creditor even though it's it's wrapped in a trust relationship it's not a real trust because it's constructive now i can't labor on this too much there's something i teach more in the course but i'll just let you know that they've construed a relationship against you and you're now expressing it out of construct okay you've made an expression out of construct and into the private realm. That's what you want to do. All right. So effectively, what's happening now is you saying, right? Well, this general relationship. If I'm going to have a real trust, I've got to get it out of general and make it a real trust, and make and put a special deposit. Now, if you look up the word special deposit in the banking dictionary, it just means a trust deposit. It means that it's no commingling. So in other words, you're not mixing anything together. 
you know, uh, 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 when I say co mingle, you're not mixing general with special. It's just on its own for a particular special deliberate purpose or just to pay the debts or, or whatever the set law described but it's got to do that function and that function only a g example of it is this if you've got a bank account okay and the bank account is a general account that pays all bills it's a general account if you open a separate bank account specifically to pay the mortgage and nothing else then any money that goes in there is mortgage money and if you can prove that over history that every time anything only transactions in that bank account has been mortgage direct debit then you can prove that that's a trust account to pay only one mortgage it's been one um, account number um, and there's only one asset in there to pay the mortgage bill so that's a trust account to pay the mortgage you understand my point it's specific for one purpose only you're not doing your shopping in, in as though or waitrose you're not going there to do your starbucks with that same account and pay the mortgage at the same time it's not general it has to be specific okay so something has to take place now the settler as i told you he does what he wants he's the rule maker he's a lawmaker and he can do what he wants and he can he sets the he can create the trust and set the trust up and he can collapse the trust now since it's not in expression yet since it was construed he can revoke this trust he can actually go in there and and, and, and um, change it around and do what he wants to do without having anyone's permission to do so so he has the right to withdraw the assets out of this trust okay we'll do what we call the withdrawal rule i'm sorry the screen's getting a little bit messy i will go over it again let me find another color here um hope there's no hope there's no one color on the screen um so he does a with Drawer of the general title now, okay. So I'm just telling you the mechanics at the moment. We'll teach you how that's done on the course, but I'm just showing you the mechanics at the moment. So he does a, a withdrawal of the asset, and he's also going to basically uh, see if I can find maybe red might have to f suffice for now. Um, he's going to redeposit. All right, I'll just stick that in here. He's going to redeposit a specific asset. Okay. All right, so I'll just repeat that. Set law. Okay. You got general assets in there. He says I can't deal with general assets because that's what's causing me the problem. So I need to pay the debt off, but I'm not going to use this, this debt to credit to rubbish because obviously that's a co-mingle. So I'm, I'm going to do a withdrawal, get rid of that. So I'm going to withdraw those assets. All right, withdraw those general assets. And I'm going to do a redeposit with something specific. Okay, and then that specific asset is only going to be used for the payment of debts or whatever it is you say it's going to be. And this trust is something we use to pay the debts of this specific account. We have a account number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. So that's stage one. So stage one is of the expression that is. Well, it's not truly stage one, but just for tonight's call, is stage one. You're going to do a withdrawal, and then you're going to do a redeposit with some assets. So what are the assets? Well, for the purposes of this call, we're going to call it a special deposit, and you're going to give instructions, so we call it an order, all right? And you have your restricted endorsement on there, which we also know it to be called... an equitable asset now let me get my black's law dictionary I'm going to read something out to you that might be you might find surprising or interesting just give me a second I'm trying to tell you you got all this stuff you go to court or you just write it down in your letters or whatever once you know what you're talking about uh, they won't be saying this is from the UK, um, USA. They can't be saying that it's something you got off the internet. This is hot stuff, and I, I encourage you. You know, since this is a private workshop, that this is not something you'll be passing on to your mates. This is for you, since you took the time out to sign up. Right. So, uh, 
equitable assets. Where are we? Equitable assets are all assets which are chargeable with the payment of debts or legacies in equity. I shall repeat. Equitable assets are all assets which are chargeable with the payment of debts or legacies in equity and which do not fall under the description of legal assets. Okay? That's by Joseph Story, who's a, 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 a serious proponent over 100 years ago. He's got some good stuff out on, on equity, which we'll talk about probably tomorrow or the day after. Um, I repeat it one more time. Equitable assets are all assets which are chargeable with the payment of debts. Chargeable with the payment of debts. Do I need to repeat it one more time or not? Yeah? It's in black and white. All right? Equitable assets are all assets which are chargeable with the payments of debts or legacies in equity. Trust, by the way, the law that governs trust is equity. So you are flipping the script completely on these guys. They won't even know where you're coming from. They're not even trained in equity. So you're coming at them with this stuff and they don't even know where you're coming from. And they, it confuses them. So you are operating at a higher level and a higher power. And most cases will just disappear all right most cases will just disappear now some of them may want to fight you a little bit hence tomorrow we're going to talk about that the day after but effectively now you understand you're going to put an equitable asset in as your res as your property in the trust is everyone with me when i say that now is it is that is that starting to open up any kind of confusion or okay good everyone's with me still so All right, so you're going to put your equitable asset in there because you've done a withdrawal of the general title and you've put a deposit of a special, unique title. You've created a trust as a set law. Now the next thing to do is to define who the trustees are and define who the bens are, the beneficiary. Now obviously, as we said before, let me just go back quickly. All right, we said here that as banks are us, right? Who was construing themselves to be beneficiaries because you or your straw man was paying them, so they're benefiting it. They're having use of something. Your promissory note, and they're receiving monies from you, so they were construing themselves to be the beneficiary, even though you are the set law. But they've, because of your performance over the past and your lack of information before today, you were the trustee. All right, so now you're gonna to have to flip the script on them. All right, remember though that the beneficiary cannot be the trustee, the trustee cannot be the beneficiary at the same time, else the trust shall collapse. It will collapse. All right, so it says, How do you create the value of the equitable asset? Well, the equitable asset has no value, and I know that's a bit of a mind warp at the moment. The equitable asset in equity uh, is the value, it's you. All right, remember, it's not for you to worry about. It's for the trustees to deal with. Your job is to enjoy it. You've put the asset in there. They know how to monetize signatures. That's not your job. That's the trust. The trust pays the debt. The trustees that then deal with it. You put your instructions. They go and deal with it. They can get agents and everything else. They've been doing it for hundreds of years. It's not going to be no big deal for them to do it now. It's just as simple as that. You've just given them an asset on which to do. You do it all the time when you sign prescriptions and uh, bank loans and all this stuff. You do it all the time, but now you've just taken it out of a general context and you put it into a specific private one. It's as simple as that. They still know what to do. And the beauty of it is it's in the private, so no one needs to know. There's no embarrassment. There's no vexation. It's just straightforward. All right? So where was I now? So effectively, the relationship needs to be defined. And you need to remember this one, if you don't remember anything else, one thing you've got to remember, that if once a beneficiary and trustees or legal and beneficial titles merge, there is no trust. And so the beauty of collapsing the trust when you express it, and this is, hopefully, I'm trying not to confuse you because this takes me about half a day to explain, but we're going to just have to go with it for now. Um, and if you come on the course, then then uh, we can explain further. But uh, we, what's going to happen now is because you want to be the beneficiary and because you want them to be the trustees, 
is a, a bit of a flip flop taking place here. All right. Now, even though what I'm saying here takes place in on, in theory immediately, it's not an immediate action. It just it does take a little while to take place. But it's just for you, just to serve as your ability to understand what I'm saying here. So what we're doing now um, is this. When you express the trust, you're saying, well, I'm taking it out of construct and I've, I'm expressing it now for what it is. And I'm saying now that the straw man, Richard, or whoever is the beneficiary and the real man, sorry, and the, uh, the bank are us. is a trustee but remember the parties are still the same just the relationships have changed all right so you you do have effects well i say two trusts but you've you've you've, you've collapsed the old trust by creating the new one because the parties have switched roles so effectively whoever had the legal title now so whoever had the legal title now has the beneficial title and whoever had the beneficial title now has a legal title so the, the trust, in theory, has completely collapsed, which is what you want. You've extinguished the debt. Uh, now, this is, I hope it hasn't confused you. Normally, it confuses people because it's not the easy thing to grasp straight away. But you, you effectively merged titles when you've done that process. And when you've merged titles, you're saying, great, I don't want this debt to exist ever again. I don't want to see it. It's, it's pretty much similar to doing an acquisition in, in OID, if anyone done the OID process. It's gone, disappeared, never to be returned. And the trustees have the job, once they've done their job, the trust will collapse, the account will disappear, it doesn't belong anywhere. It's gone. And this is the beauty of trust. So once you can understand the, the process of collapsing the trust, that you have the right to withdraw and redeposit, you can do that. It's a doctrine, you can do it, it's not a problem. Then you and you can prove this if you have to prove it because they don't like the receiving these documents, but unfortunately they have to receive it. And another, another beauty of that is if you select your trustees carefully, like solicitors, for example, they cannot actually say they don't want to do it. It's illegal, so it's it's, it's a win-win really. So all you've got to do is be knowledgeable on how to operate with this, um, because I said you may get some resistance, especially if it's dealing with you know large amounts of money or solicitors' firms or whatnot who think they know it all and don't want to be told what to do by uh, a non-council member. Then uh, you may have some resistance. Don't get me wrong; it doesn't mean that what this is doing is not right. And I've seen so many results where they don't like it, um, but yet still they can't force you to do anything else. Um, you win. You know this stuff is very powerful. So I'm going to leave it there because it's it's, it's half eleven now and, and um, people got work tomorrow and everything else. So I'm going to stop there. And we're going to pick it up again tomorrow. Um, I hope you have enjoyed this. I hope you have learned something. I will do a, a recap tomorrow before we go into the um, briefly into the enforcement side of things. Um, and uh, yeah, if you've got any other questions that, that you think are between tonight and tomorrow, then send me an email and I'll try and address those as well. But other than that, I really thank you for your time and your patience with me. I do appreciate that. And um, please don't miss tomorrow. Um, whatever you do, uh, don't miss tomorrow. Don't miss Friday. Um, we've got a very special offer for you on, on Friday, but you need to just kind of hang out for the next two days for, to get, get to the end of it. So thank you very much, guys. Have a brilliant evening, and um, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow, 9 o'clock. Excellent. Cheers.